Proverbs chapter 2. If you want to stand and stretch your legs here real quick, Lord willing, we won't be too long tonight. Um, we'll try to, try to boil it down, but if you'll stand, turn to Proverbs chapter number 2. We'll read the first five verses, and then we'll dive in, and Lord willing, cover the whole chapter here tonight. Uh, some of these, I, I, I know I told you I'm going to try to approach this thing more like a verse-by-verse study, but uh, some of these chapters, uh, as I've been kind of reviewing this book, uh, they lend themselves to preaching. So I guess we'll just roll with it. You don't know what you're going to get next week. You might get a list of 20 definitions and be falling asleep on me. I'll try not to let that happen again. But we may teach through it, uh, may preach through it, but I just want to enjoy it. I want to have liberty to follow God. Amen? And to just adjust accordingly as each week goes by. A great book here. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. Brother Rob, would you ask the Lord to bless the preaching tonight, please? Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, as we we kick off chapter 2 here, I notice, first of all, what jumps out at my attention is three ifs in the first four verses. He said, my son, if thou wilt receive my words. He said again in verse 3, yea, if thou criest after knowledge. And again in verse number 4, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures. So as we start into Proverbs chapter 2, it starts out with if, if, if. So what's going to come on the heels of the ifs is two warnings and a promise. But it's all contingent on three ifs. So if I can get the if right, I got some good stuff coming in this chapter. So by way of introduction, let's look at the ifs. He says in verse number one, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. So number one, you and I need to recognize that in order for us to gain whatever wisdom it is that God wants us to gain, in order for us to be this son who receives a blessing, in order for us to be this son who receives warning about problems and temptations and trials and failures and things that are going to come into life to destroy us, in order for us to get the benefit, we have to live up to the if. If thou wilt receive my words. That's how it starts. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a heart to receive the words of God? Well, that's pretty tough because those words go against your flesh. Those words don't just go against your flesh. They go against this world. Everything about the words of God really runs contrary to the nature of a man. It runs contrary to the spirit of a man. It runs contrary to the spirit of the world. So we know right now, right out of the gate, there's a big if in front of us. That if is, if we will receive his words. Most of the time, we don't receive the words of God. It's one thing to sit around and say, I'm a Bible believer. It's one thing to say, I read my Bible. I believe my Bible. It's another thing to say, I readily and willingly receive those words. That's all good and you know, fine and dandy when those words are what we want to hear. You find out who's who when you tell them what they don't want to hear, but it's actually truth. Then you find out who's receiving and who's not. What are some signs of receiving? Well, receiving the words of God has to do with hiding His commandments in their heart. And hide my commandments with thee. Really, do you meditate on the words of God? Do you you love the words of God? Do you hide those things inside your very soul? Do you memorize the scriptures? Does God give you a verse that carries you through your day? I am not a signs guy. Brother Todd was giving his testimony. He told me, he said, God, I know I'm not an Israelite, but I do need a sign. God said, I ain't giving you a sign. I'll give you a verse. Here's your sign. Now he's got a verse in his heart, and he got a verse at the beginning, and when he was doubting the thing, he got a verse at the end. You know what God gave him? God gave him something to put in his heart. 
That's what you and I need. That's receiving the words of God. And he says then, even more if you're receiving the words of God, verse 2, so that then incline thine ear unto wisdom. That inclining means a leaning towards. So actually, you are looking for and you're leaning your ear towards and you're trying to hear what wisdom has to say. If my wife is talking to me and I can't hear her very good, do I just stand there and look straight ahead and smile and go, yeah? Uh Uh-uh. You know what I do? I'll lean over and say, what was that? Little Ava likes to run up to me. Daddy, Daddy, can I tell you something? I got got to say something. Okay, what? Come here, I got to tell your ear. Okay, so what do I do? I incline to her. Why? Because I actually want to hear what she's going to say. It's going to be something cute. It's going to be something strange. It's going to be something that's going to make me giggle. Amen. (laughs) You know what? You and I aren't like that with wisdom. If we're a person, if we're a Christian, if we're a church who receives the words of God, then what we do is actually strive a little bit, lean a little bit, stretch a little bit, focus a little bit to try to get what wisdom has to say to us. There's a leaning towards it. And then above and beyond that in verse number 2, he says, not only inclining your ear, not only hiding your commandments, but applying thine heart to understanding. That would have to do with work. Make an effort. Apply yourself. How many of you ever told your kids, apply yourself? How many of you had your boss say, apply your... Well, I can't. Well, it's too hard. It's not too hard. You just don't want to get in there and do it. You know what you're saying? Apply yourself. Well, Christians all the time, oh, it's too hard. Oh, the Bible's so hard to understand. Get a dictionary. It's not that difficult. You know what the problem is? A fool doesn't want to apply their heart. Well, you know what understanding is. We passed you out all those definitions. The fear of the Lord is understanding. To depart from evil is understanding. Are you applying your heart to know God? Number two, there's another if. If thou criest after knowledge. You know what a key to really getting it? I mean, to having it click in your heart, to really understanding what God's having to say, is actually having a prayer life. That's what he's saying. Cry after knowledge, if thou cry after knowledge. When's the last time you got on your face and said, God, I don't know what to do in this situation. I don't understand what the right thing is. I can look at it and analyze it. I can see it from lots of angles. But God, I need some knowledge of you and knowing what you would have me to do. We don't approach God that way. We don't usually approach our Bible reading that way. Let's just be honest. We get up in the morning, we flop it open. Okay, where'd I leave off at? Where am I today? Oh man, this chapter's got 22 verses. All right, let's see. I got to go through chapter 6. Ooh, 35 verses 23. Okay, well. Lord, just speak to my heart. You're laughing because you know it's exactly what you do. You know how I know? <laughs> Amen. Well, what, what do you think? You think you're going to really grow in God that way? You know, we ought, to be, we ought to be opening up our Bible and kneeling down before God and saying, God, please give me something today. You'd be much better off to just read a couple of chapters and have God actually speak to you because your heart, your soul, the very essence of who you are is crying out to God saying, God, I desire some knowledge. I desire to know the truth. I want to see the truth about this book. I want to understand the doctrine. God, I want to see the truth about myself. That's a tough one. We were cracking up before church this morning because we're standing back there trying to get that sound system adjusted. And and Brother Chad's got his his Sunday school lesson sitting on the, the table in front of me. And there, some are going this way and some are going that way. That's obnoxious. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to focus on the music and who needs to be tuned up and turned down and whether or not they're balanced and all that stuff. And we know we're, we're rapping back there about who do you think? Oh, you know, and I'm looking at the, I, I can't focus with this obnoxious mess in front of me. So I picked up his, his papers and I straightened them all up and stacked them and set them down. And he said, oh, Pastor, you just, uh, 
straightened up. He said, your OCD just kicked in. You just straightened up my sordid Sunday school lessons. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I don't even remember what the point of that was, but it was funny. <laughs> Thou criest after knowledge. I want to know God. I want to say, oh, the truth about myself. I want to know the truth about me. You know what happened? I started laughing, and I looked at him. I said, man, I, everybody was back there laughing at me. I said, I feel like my face is red. They're like, you are. You're embarrassed. You know what it was? It was like a giant mirror that came up in front of me. Like, I'm that OCD. I'm that obnoxious. Wow. You know, it's hard sometimes to see the truth about yourself. It can be embarrassing. <laughs> It can be annoying, but it's valuable. God showed me some things about myself this week, and that's why that revival for me was such a blessing. It was so productive. But you know, God usually doesn't sit down and say, let me tell you how great you are, Mike. Let me tell you why you're so much better than everybody else. It seems like when I get a little knowledge, I get a lot of sorrow. When I get a little knowledge... I get a little sober. Grace is saying, you know, what's wrong? You know, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I, I, you know what it feels like? It feels like I'm beat up, but not in a bad way, in like a good way. Have you ever been sore? You know, you worked out or you did something and you're really sore, but it's kind of like cool to know like, wow, I need to really need to work on that. I really need to run more. I didn't really need to work on because I'm weak in this area. So that's a kind of soreness that's like a, a good thing because God exposes your weaknesses. But we don't want to see that. Our heart doesn't say, God, please, no matter what, show me some knowledge. Lift us up thy voice for understanding. We ought to be a people who prays and who seeks truth. Listen, if you'll do that, you got some good things coming. If you'll do that, you're going to grow spiritually. If you'll do that, we can get somewhere. But if you don't, who knows how it's all going to turn out? Who knows how much pain you're going to wind up in? Who knows how many mistakes you're going to make? If thou seekest her as silver, verse 4, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, if... Let me ask you a question. If somebody confirmed it, that there was a gold brick buried in your yard, it's confirmed, and it's yours, And it's anywhere from two inches below to four feet below. And it could be anywhere in your yard, and it's worth two million. Who in this room would not go home, turn on some lights, pull the truck or the car in the backyard, pop on the brights, and get you a shovel, and get the whole family out there, and work all night? I know I would. (laughs) If you want to stop by my house and bury one, you can laugh and watch me tear my whole yard apart. If I know it's worth $2 million, I'll go buy a little backhoe, the small, cheapest one I can on credit, and dig it up. We'll get it quick. Why? Because there's something very valuable there. There's something priceless there. So I'm going to seek that thing until I find it. I'm going to get in there. I'm going to get at it. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to allow distractions. I am going to make that the focus of my life. My sleep doesn't matter. Just bring me some water when I get dehydrated and my muscles start cramping so I can keep digging. That's all I need. That's all I want until I find what I'm looking for. Christian, you and I do not seek truth like that. But we ought to be a people who seek after it with everything that's in our soul. It ought to mean everything to us to get to know God better, to have some understanding, to have some knowledge, to seek the truth as for hid treasures. Well, if that isn't convicting, you must be some kind of Christian. If you'll do it. You know what's funny to me? Paul said in Philippians 3, 8 through 11, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness of Christ, which is by faith. Count everything but dung. 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul said, nothing matters to me but trying to get to know Jesus Christ better, that I may know Him. How do you know the Lord? Do you know Him well tonight? Do you understand Him well tonight? Hey, I'll be honest with you. I don't believe I know a a thimble, a, a tiny piece of what I ought to know, a fraction of what I should know. I want to know God, and it convicts me that many, many days come, and many many days go and I don't truly seek him I don't truly desire to know him that if is absent in my life and therefore I'm vulnerable and open to some very bad things that's a scary thought but if we'll seek him as for hid treasures he said then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord do you fear God yeah well If you're not receiving his words, hiding them in your heart, inclining your ear, applying your heart, if you're not crying after knowledge and lifting up your voice for understanding, if you're not seeking him as silver and searching for his his treasures, you don't. You might be scared of God, but look, somebody who knows the fear of the Lord does what? They depart from evil. A lot of people say they fear God, but they continue in their destructive behavior. A lot of people say they fear God, but they don't have the wisdom of true fear of God. The true fear of God gives us some wisdom. It changes our behavior patterns. You'll notice a couple of things here. If you and I will do these things, then the process begins. If you'll receive the words, if you'll cry after knowledge, if you'll seek, then a process will actually begin. Look at the process in verse 6. For the Lord giveth wisdom, and out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. You know what God will do? God will give you wisdom. God can give you wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him do what? Ask. Let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. God will give you wisdom. I don't care what your IQ is. I don't care how much education you do or don't have. God, God can give you wisdom. I don't care if your mama and daddy told you you were stupid your whole life. I don't care if your parents were always embarrassed of your grades. I don't care if the whole world says, well, you know him, you know her. They're not the brightest, you know, nice personality, good person, but they're not all that sharp. Forget them all. God can give you wisdom. It's not the same as an IQ. It's not the same as smart. It's not the same as education. It's not the same as influence. It's different. It's something that God Almighty can and will give. I want wisdom. And I know that I might not be the sharpest. And I might do some stupid things. I might make some big mistakes. But I also know that if I get a hold of God, he can give me wisdom. And boy, do I ever need it. We all need wisdom, don't we? I mean, you got a relationship, don't you? Everybody in here has got some kind of a relationship. you got an employer. You've got family. Some of you got a marriage and children. Don't we need wisdom? Good night, man. Then God takes a fool like me and says, I'm going to make you a pastor. When people heard I was called a preacher, I said, brother, I think you'd be great for evangelism, but you are not a pastor. It's just not you. And God said, yep, that's exactly why I'm going to make you a pastor. So everybody knows I spoke through Balaam's donkey, and I can speak through you. I need wisdom. I desire wisdom. Look at 1 John chapter 2. I'll show you a verse here, and, I, and, I, and I'll, I'll mention it because there's a lot of people that misuse this verse because they're biblical midgets and theological dunces. Amen. The root of the problem is they got rebellion in their heart, really. 1 John chapter 2, look at verse 27. 1 John 2, 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now, people say all the time, well, the Bible says you need not that any man teach you. 
Like I got a text message not too long ago, you know, now I know why God hates the pastors in his word or something like that. What a blessing, brother. Thank you so much. God bless you too. Have a nice life. <laughs> and it wasn't anybody who was a member of our church or nothing, so don't worry about it. But, you know, I, now I know why God hates the pastors. You know, need not that any man teach you but the Spirit of God. Okay, well, first of all, doctrinally, you know who this is talking to? Doctrinally? This is a general epistle. The church is gone. The church has been raptured out when you get the doctrine you find in First and Second Peter and James and Hebrews. That doctrine is talking to a tribulation saint. You realize doctrinally in tribulation, the pastors are called out? The church is gone? Now, I'll put a balance on it in a second because the Bible says what it says and we can apply this and I'll show you in a minute. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. Galatians, Ephesians, then Philippians. Look at verse 11. Ephesians 4.11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and what? Pastors and teachers. There's no comma there. Uh, Paul told Timothy that he's to be apt to teach. That's a pastor's job is to teach. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What he's saying here is that God gives the church some gifts, and one of those gifts is a pastor. And a pastor is to be apt to teach. So, well, you need not that any man teach you. Well, I hate pastors. I hate churches. I, well, then you don't understand God and proper doctrine of your Bible. In the church age, God did set up the church, and God does give as a gift to the church. That when, when, a, when a husband buys a gift for his bride, it's the way a husband shows the bride his love, correct? So that's all a pastor is to a church. It's God saying, I love my church, so I'm going to call some men and enable some men to teach you my word and to help you with that. Does that make sense? Okay, but wait a minute. Is the pastor teaching you or the Holy Spirit teaching you? Answer, the Holy Spirit teaches you through the pastor. He uses them like a channel. That's the job. I'll show you. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Folks, I don't know what, I, what, what would ever happen to me. I know I wouldn't be here tonight if God hadn't sent some men into my life, some pastors into my life. I thank God for them. I believe in giving honor where honor is due. Amen. There have been some good men who've helped me, man. If I had this attitude, I don't need a man. The Holy Spirit will teach me. Oh, my word. I'd be so much farther behind than I already am. <laughs> I'm far enough behind. I don't need to be further behind. I'm glad God sent some. But you want to know what I do understand? I understand that it's not necessarily that man giving me and imparting to me the knowledge. Because all he would be would be like a talking fence post if the Holy Spirit didn't teach me. Does that make sense? I stand here and talk all I want, but if the Holy Spirit doesn't teach you, you don't get it. Look at 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So you know what? The Holy Spirit is the one who teaches you. God, God is the one who imparts knowledge. So you know what? You and I need to be people who seek God to give us some wisdom. Now listen, if you're, you know, you're going to try to be one of these people who's just rebellious, I think Brother Peacock mentioned it, the home church thing. That's a huge thing going on nowadays. And it's just, it just stems from a rebellious spirit. I've never met one who didn't have a rebellious spirit. Listen, I understand he didn't die on the cross for my sins. Amen? Amen. But God does speak through him. But I know when I learn something, when a guy teaches something, and I go, oh, I never saw that before. You know who just opened up the lights? The man didn't open up the lights. He's a talking fence post. The Holy Spirit opened up the lights inside me. And I go, oh, I see that. Wow, that's really good. You know, we ought to be a people who seek God to give us some wisdom. Back in Proverbs chapter 2, 
Boy, nothing would thrill my soul more than to know that before everybody walked in here on Sunday, they spent some time saying, God, please teach me something today. I I believe with all my heart a lot fewer people would leave saying, well, I just don't get anything out of the preaching. I just don't like his style. Well, I just didn't think, well, you know what? I, I, I don't mind the message, but the messenger sure turns me off. I don't like that approach. A lot, that'd be a lot less of that. If people just said, God, when I get there today, would you show me something? Then when God shows you something, God answered your prayer. God gave you some wisdom because you were a person who said, if I, then he. If I, then he. If I, so I'm going to do what he said and therefore he did what he promised. You'd understand it was God speaking to you. Instead of getting that protective attitude and me versus him attitude, and you know, I just don't like his style. Yeah, something's wrong. If a guy's given truth, I don't care if he stands here behind the pulpit like Dr. Caesar and peers over his glasses like he's in a medical class. You know, he prefers to hold the microphone, you know, and he's and he's now you know, you know it, I love the guy. I think he's great. Why? Because God shows me stuff. Or if he's got us laughing so hard, we're falling out of our our pews, crying because he's laughing so hard one night, down here weeping the next night because God's moving. I mean, people were at the altar weeping. It doesn't matter to me. I could care less either way. I'm glad one man is himself and does what he does, and the other man is himself, and he does what he does. And by God's grace, I'm going to be me and do what I do. And if you and I desire to learn, God will do what he does and God will turn on the lights in your life and he'll show you some stuff because God gives the wisdom there's a process the process is seeking him and the Lord giveth it in verses 7 and verse 9 a growth process takes place he layeth up sound wisdom do you see that he layeth it up it's like layered that thrills my soul That thrills me. You know why that thrills me? Because I'm 36 years old and that is young. Amen. And I feel like God has taught me so much. I think I'm super smart. (laughs) That was a joke. Please laugh. Make me feel better. (laughs) I feel like, man, it's just so much in this book. I can't believe all that I've learned. And you know what God does every once in a while? God says, Hey, let me show you how stupid you are. (laughs) That's happened to me recently. Like, wow, how could I have missed that all these years? You hear something said and parroted, preached, and you hear it, and you hear it, and you hear it, and you hear it, until you just start saying it, and you even believe it. And then God the Holy Ghost shows up, and he goes, bloop, and turns a light bulb on, and you're like, duh. I mean, like, big time, major, duh, duh, duh. Now, that doesn't bum me out, really, to be honest with you. That thrills my soul. Because I want to, I'm little, uh, the little old man, right? Nobody says that about big guys. Amen. All you big guys, I'll be laughing when I'm 70 and I'm still jogging up and down the road and you're walking in here on your walkers and your wife is helping you up the steps. And I'll run by my jogging shorts waving, praise Jesus with my Bluetooth, you know, singing some gospel hymns. Amen. I want to be a little old man just going for Jesus. I know what else I want. I want to be a little old man going for Jesus, getting some more layers. Amen. I want to be learning some things I never saw before. I want God to be turning on some lights I didn't know could be turned on. It's exciting to me that there is a growth process in place. God does not give me more than I'm able to handle today. And I'm glad of that. I'm thankful for it. I just want to get whatever he has for me now. And tomorrow, I can't wait to find out what he's got then. There's a growth process. And God knows growth takes time. I mean, folks, you may get to be 95 or whatever old, been in the book your whole life, learning and growing and trying to do right your whole life, experienced beyond anybody else alive at that time. And God said, I hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God's prepared for them. You think we've ever tapped into all there is? You think you ever know the Bible? Just because you can pick somebody else apart or hear them misquote a verse and you got it right or know that while they're off on that doctrine, that doesn't mean you know the Bible. 
There's so much there. There's a growth process. Hey, that excites me. I want to make sure the ifs in my life are lined up because I want to see that thing happening. I want to see him laying up sound wisdom for the righteous. Verse number nine, then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity. Yea, every good path. There's all kinds of good paths. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to explore. The Christian life is not boring. If it's boring, you're not really living it. Before you know it, you're running back over there to the world. There's a preservation given. Look at verse 8. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Verse 11. Discretion shall preserve thee. Understanding shall keep thee. If the ifs are in place in your life, there's preservation for you. Folks, you've heard me say it before. I don't want to go seven years into this church, 31 years into salvation, 10 years into raising children, 13, almost 13 years into marriage, and fail on God. Amen. Fail on my wife. Fail on my kids. Fail on you. That bothers me. I don't, if it doesn't bother you, you're way more secure than I am. I have some insecurities. You know why? I've seen better men than me farther down the road than me make a mess of things. You guys, that bothers me. Well, I don't want the devil to get advantage of me either. I don't want to live my life in fear and always sitting there like, oh, what if I fail? What if I mess up? Oh, no. Well, something's wrong with that picture too. Overconfidence isn't good. But too much fear of the wrong things isn't good either. So you know what? It comforts my heart. It comforts my heart that I can look at the Bible and say, God said, if, if, if. Am I doing these things? Because if I am, he said he'll preserve me. Wow. Hey, I need the preservation. Being confident of this very thing. I'll never forget when I surrendered to the call to preach. My dad wrote in the, in the, in the front leaf of my Bible. He wrote, being confident of this very thing. That he which hath begun a good work and you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I'm glad I can have confidence in that. I'm glad that he said he'll preserve me. Because to be honest with you, I'm super good at making messes. That's all I'm really good at. I'm super good at ruining relationships. I'm super good. I mean, even when I care about people, I'm real good at sending a message to them that I don't care. Even if I think somebody's intelligent, I have a way of letting them know through body language or looks on my face that I think they're stupid. I am great at making messes. I need God's help. I want some wisdom. I want to be preserved. I want my life and the work and the labor and the, and the love and all that there is that goes into having a wife and having children and having family and friends and church and whatever your circumstances, all that goes into it, that it's not wasted time, that it's not wasted years, that it's not wasted effort, that God is going to see me through to the end. I want to make sure and do a gut check tonight and say, are the ifs in place in my life? Because he said he'll preserve me. What's he preserve you from? He preserves you from evil men, verses 12 to 15, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the forwardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they're, and, and they're forward in their paths. You know what? I, I'm driving on the way here tonight, and I'm watching a nice vehicle. Owning that kind of a vehicle and, and kind of seeing the age of the driver, I'm guessing, you know, little past middle age, middle class, upper middle class, a solid job, family, family man, with the costume of, a, of a, some kind of a zombie or something, you know, the hand all crinkled up like that, hanging off the back of the vehicle with the gate shut on it, you know? And like blood dripping off and veins everywhere. And there's like somebody is in the back of their car and they slam the door on his arm after they killed him or something. And I'm like, what in the world is up with a culture? We're adults now. Are these Halloween parties? I don't know if it's always going on, but it seems to me like it sure has picked up in the last few years. Where adults are doing these dress up costume Halloween party things. We're obsessed with this stuff. You know what? That's the paths of darkness. You know, do what you want in your own home, but how can you, I mean, you know, how can you sit around and watch, like, 
demons crawling out of hell and walking around on the planet and not be like, yeah, that doesn't really fit with the preaching today in church and what God did Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday in my life. And there's something about this spirit that's not meshing with the spirit of God. You know, do what you want. I'm not, whatever. But what's up with us? What's up with the evil men? What's up with the infatuation and addiction to evil? And it's, I mean, it's like worse and worse. It's not, it's got to be the goriest and the nastiest and the ugliest and the, what's the matter with you? Something ain't right about the spirit of that stuff. The closer you get to the tribulation period, the more there's going to be a rise in witchcraft and abominations all across the world, not just in America. You're seeing the sign of his soon coming, the signs of the rapture coming soon. I believe that with all my heart. Evil men and seducers wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I want to be delivered from this stuff. But you see, the evil man, well, where does he come from? The love of money. Where's all these Hollywood costumes, these, these Halloween costumes coming from? Somebody wants to make money. That's a big market, man. Now, I mean, it's like they're setting up, getting ready for a Halloween, and it's just a big push. All these Halloween stores pop up. It's the love of money. The shows that are running, it's the love of money. That's all it is. They want the book. Well, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Folks, I want to be delivered from the love of the money. I want to be delivered from the culture and the, and the covetousness of the society. I ain't saying it's wrong to, to, you know, get yourself a new car or buy yourself a toy if you want. Do whatever you want. Amen. I've never tried to push people in this church to give, give, give to the point where they got to sacrifice things they want. I'm just trying to say if our hearts start going after money, we're going in the way of evil men. And the Bible says it leads down a road where you're pierced through with many sorrows. Don't love that stuff. Watch out for the way of evil men. Because funny enough, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Look at verse 16. To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger with flattereth with her lips, which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead. You see that weirdness? I mean, that's weirdness, guys. Plug that into the culture today with this inclination towards death and dead walking people. I'm not... <laughs> his phrase, I have never used it in the pulpit, I use it all the time out of the pulpit, but his phrase, I'm not smoking crack, this thing seems to fit, amen? What's the, what's the infatuation? Her paths unto the dead, none that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. A weird thing, that way of evil men. Well, where does evil start? The love of money is the root of all evil. And as a nation goes after covetousness and people go after money, their morals follow right behind it. Brother Lynch said it a thousand times. There's so much it's brainwashed into my head. He said, if a man can't control his money, he can't control his morals. Something's wrong. Look at our nation. Loving the money, worshiping the almighty dollar, anything it takes to get money, and now an inclination towards death, an inclination towards immorality, an inclination towards immodesty, more and more and more perversion and a fleshly and lustful level. The Halloween costumes, it's not enough that you've got zombies and all this stuff walking around. They've got to be half naked. Are you guys seeing it in the passage? Somebody's not living up to the if. Somebody's not seeking God. And now you got people obsessed, willing to do anything for money, obsessed with getting the latest and greatest, obsessed then with more lusts, more youthful lusts, and they're piercing themselves through, and their soul is just all messed up, and an infatuation with death. Listen, the strange woman flattereth with her lips. Oh, you're so cute. Oh, hogwash. Hey, if your wife still thinks you're cute after she sees what a pig you are, take it. Amen. Praise the Lord. A stranger that wants to walk up and flatter. You flattered the last guy. What do I look, stupid? Quiet. Why would that make it quiet? She flattereth with her lips. 
You know what you tell her to do? Shut up. I don't want to hear it. I'll, if I want a compliment, I'll fish for one from grace. Amen. I do it all the time. She's used to it. Amen. Strange woman likes to flatter. She lies. She forsakes all that she's taught. Forsaketh the guide of her youth. There's something God puts in a woman that wants to be modest, that wants to be cherished, that wants to be loved for who she is, wants to be understood. She forsakes that compass and that guide of her youth. Well, if she'll forsake that, she'll forsake you. Amen. Oh, she loves me. No, she doesn't. Forgetteth the covenant of her God. Well, what makes you think if a woman won't cheat on well, will cheat on her husband with you or live in an immoral relationship with you that she won't turn around and cheat on you. Amen. Or go the other way. If a man won't will cheat on his wife for you, he will cheat on you. Amen. Amen. Listen, folks, this stuff happens. If somebody's, you know, messed up, forget it. Put it in the past. Ask God to forgive you and move forward. But I'm talking to people that are in a situation where they're being tempted at work. They're being tempted in their mind. They're being tempted in their heart. They're unhappy in their relationship. I'm warning you. Young men, you better be careful. Real careful. You need some wisdom. Young ladies, you need wisdom. Because the wrong person will read you down the wrong path, and the wrong path always comes out at the wrong place. Wait on God to give you the right one. You'll be way farther ahead. The last thing, in the preservation, the paths are kept. Look at verses 20 through 22. Thou mayest, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of righteousness. For the upright shall dwell in them, and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth, and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. I want to keep the paths of righteousness. I like that phrase, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men. Paul told Timothy to be a lover, or Titus, one to be a lover of good men. You don't realize there's been some great men who've gone before us. We all have a good Christian example somewhere to look to, right? Oh, I, you know, I'm so tired of all the negativity. If I talk about a scumbag preacher... And we just started up here with Brandon and just went all the way up every row and up this side, back up here, and then I finished. We could all name one without naming the same guy twice. Couldn't we? Well, I want to give horror stories about an unfaithful Christian. We could all do that, couldn't we? You know what your human nature does? It latches on to the negativity while it ignores the good men that have gone before us. There have been some who have made it. There have been some who started right and finished right. They weren't perfect. They made their mistakes in route. They may have been David's where they made their mistake and got messed up and got themselves into a big old heap of mess and, and God got them out of it. Thank God for God's goodness and God's grace. Amen? I mean, David messed the thing up bad, didn't he? David would be one we'd be preaching at saying, don't go down there. You're getting flattered. You're going the wrong way. You're losing your wisdom. But hey, God's good. God preserved his man. Even when his man messed up, God got him back in the saddle. Think about Moses. He messed up, lost his temper, ruined the type, got locked out of the promised land. He messed up, but Moses sure did finish good. Elijah spent some time under the juniper tree, but Elijah finished okay, didn't he? I mean, look, folks, we all mess up. But I'm glad there's a God in heaven who, if I will, if I will, if I will, then he can and does and will see me through. He will preserve me. I can keep the right path, and I'm glad of that. How many of you young ladies have seen an older woman who's jaded and miserable, and you go, man, I hope I don't wind up like that? If your mother-in-law is in the room, don't raise your hand. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's probably, with my luck, there's only one mother-in-law here. She'd be like, he was pointing me out. I promise it was just a mother-in-law joke. My mother-in-law likes him. I pick on her with him. Amen. Have you seen somebody like that? Man, I don't want to wind up like her. You don't have to. Ain't that a blessing? How many of you fellows have said, I don't want to be like 
him or her. Or maybe it's your dad or it's something else that you just have been hurt by. And yeah, I don't want to be like that. You don't have to. There are some paths that good men have taken. And he says that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of righteousness. Boy, God help me. God help me. I would love someday for my little girls to file by my casket. And the greatest thing would be if it was all a joke and I jumped up and said, ah, like that. But anyhow, I'd love them to file by my casket and say, (laughs) you're just now getting that? That was a delayed reaction. Are we tired from a long week? I'll wrap it up. I will. I'll wrap it up. I'd like them to walk by and look at me and say, Dad, he wasn't much, but he was a good man. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's easy to do wrong. I have an inclination to do wrong. It's called my nature. But he said here, Thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of righteousness. For the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it. Boy, I sure want to finish right. And God said, If you'll receive my words, if you'll cry after knowledge, if you'll seek it as silver, it'll work out. Listen, I'm done, okay? This is a, this is a postlude or whatever you call it. If you're not saved this night tonight, if you don't know for sure if you died today, you're going to heaven, you can walk out those doors lost and die and go to hell. But you don't have to. If you'll hear the words of God and say, look, if you can show me in the Bible, I'll receive it. If you'll lean yourself to it, just, okay, what does it have to say? Is this God speaking to me or is this this preacher or this church? If you'll just lean yourself to it, if you'll seek it, you'll find it. You'll find it. You can be saved tonight. Let's bow our heads for prayer.